then uh, we have a quorum and we have reached the appointed hour. Um, so I will read the standard opening statement. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 9th of November, 2023. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that is consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes a continuation of a notice of intent for a septic system replacement on Cross Path Road, a request for a determination of applicability to determine if utility pole installation in buffer zone is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance, a request for determination of applicability to determine if septic system installation in the riverfront area is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance. This is on Meadow Street. Uh, and a notice of intent for construction of a four bay garage, driveway, and stormwater management system on Southampton Road. Uh, so, first up is are there any general public comments uh, not having to do with a specific case that is before us today? If not, we have one set of minutes to approve. Uh, I will not move their approval because it was for a meeting in June when I was away. So um, someone want else want to make a motion to approve those minutes? I'll move. And a second? All second. Any amendments or modifications to the minutes as they had been prepared? If not, um, all in favor? Sarah, roll call. Roll call vote. Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? I'll say yes, even though I wasn't there. They are in proper form. And um, uh, so I, and I, I, I understand I am able to vote even if I were not there. So. Perfect. Um, so the first case, a uh, continuation of the notice of intent for septic system replacement within uh, borderland, bordering land subject to flooding. Uh, this is on uh, Cross Path Road. Uh, so uh, who's here uh, representing that? Uh, applicant, um, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, this is Chenard and Jonathan Fogelson. And we've seen the uh, additional information that you've uh, presented. Um, uh, and so I guess, do you have anything else you want to add verbally before I open it to questions from the commissioners? Yeah, we'd, we'd like to thank you all for giving us an opportunity uh, to continue the discussion and to get a survey. We were actually able to get a surveyor finally out there after being a bit aggressive, going, shall going. we say. Um, and But importantly and substantively, um, turns out that the site does not shed directly all the way uh, consistently towards the east, as old publicly available documentation implies. Rather, it kind of dips towards the center. Uh, so um, it's a good thing that we did our homework and that you compelled us to do so. And uh, and that, of course, modified our, our, our proposal. Uh, so thank you. Sure enough. Anything else? Not, not, not from us. Questions from commissioners? Our, our concern a couple of weeks ago had been the lack of a proper survey and uh, uh, therefore the our inability to exercise real judgment about uh, whether the flood storage, uh, compensatory storage uh, plan um, was properly uh, designed. Um, so any uh, further, Questions at this time from commissioners. Uh, maybe a comment, not a question. Um, still, okay. the higher pro um, elevations are a problem as far as compensatory flood storage. They Could you repeat that? They can only get so much from the building. Could you repeat yeah, that? You, you, you went in and out a little bit. 
Let's say that again, Mason. Yeah, uh, compensatory flood storage in the higher elevations um, is still a problem. Um, it's it's not compensated for, and it's more difficult, especially in your area, where where you're totally in the floodplain, even your house. Um, and because it's so flat down there, where are you going to get the compensatory flood storage for the higher elevations? Um, one idea is to go off site, which is a real pain because unless you have friends in the mountains or something, uh, you're, you're kind of not going to get it down there. And I, I really don't know what the uh, the total answer is down there. You've done the best you can as far as you know the buildings that you had taken down, although not. I don't know what the elevation was of the buildings that were taken down. I assume they're about the same elevations as the structures that you have left on the site. And they look like they were pretty substantial buildings. So you add up, I assume they weren't flood proof. Water would flow through them. So you were just stuck with just the um, wall thicknesses get your flood storage out of it. And there was quite a lot of buildings. Well, there was two major buildings. And then you're you're, you're taking down, I guess, two smaller buildings. Um, and probably all together, they're gonna come fairly close. It's about the best you can do for the site though. That, that was more or less a comment rather than. Yeah, understood. And and I had a question about how the compensatory flood storage was represented in the table. Um, like the, it looked like the homestead demolition or homestead uh, provisions were related to demolition of structures, but the way the table is laid out, it only showed um, the 118 foot elevation, 118, right? which didn't quite seem to make sense. So maybe some of that is being provided at upper elevations and just hasn't been captured. I actually didn't really understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, maybe, maybe part of the answer is the fact that the the lower elevations of the proposed berm are not full footprint, so to speak. So it's less uh, volume. But I don't know that that addresses your question because I didn't fully understand it. Well, I think Sarah, if if gave the comp storage for the 118 elevation. It had to be basically the buildings, I would think. Yeah, it was just curious that it was only represented at 118 feet, you know, if yeah. you're shed and, you know, it's- Yeah, you could actually plug that in probably tall, for like... each elevation going up to uh, 125 and a half is about- the flood. I think flood it was 122. Flood. Yeah. But just, just to just to be clear, just to be clear, we're not we're not claiming any volume associated with the structures at all. We're just noting that they have either been removed or are going to be removed, but we're we're not calculating their volume as part of the compensatory storage whatsoever. Um so so if we want to consider that extra that isn't noted we can but we're, we're not we're not claiming any of that volume whatsoever okay that wasn't quite clear so in if anything it seems like you're probably providing excess capacity than would be required and it's just not represented here right and and we're very happy doing more than what we just need to well and uh, it, it, there have been cases as, as sarah said in her uh, uh, staff report where uh, for relatively small scale um, projects like this that we have allowed, and, and where as Mason described, this is so flat that you really can't, um, there isn't anything to, to change at the higher elevations. Uh, so that uh, we have, uh, and your approach to that is, um, well, we're gonna remove some, um, some fill um, remove some of the existing ground um, at the, the the lower level, and in fact, that uh, just logically will uh, therefore not diminish the, the your you're compensating for the mounding of the septic system um, by removing uh, ground elsewhere, even though it's at a lower 
um, uh, level. And we have at times allowed that uh, in situations where it isn't practical to do anything else. Um, because in principle, yeah, you, you're, you're not resulting in a net loss of compensatory flood storage. So uh, uh, we have allowed that in the past, um, I, as I say, on relatively small scale projects like this. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? If not, um, is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And a second? Second. second. Made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, Sarah, you want to uh, do a roll call? Uh, quick roll call. Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. It is, may have been apparent from my comment that this is a case where I feel like um, uh, the applicant has done the best they can. Um, and I think that was apparent in Mason's comments as well. And that um, in practical terms, there's no reduction in compensatory storage because they're actually removing, even though it's not, as the rules say, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one match at every elevation, nonetheless, mm -hmm water is going to go down and instead of uh, being at a certain level. So that the, the uh, uh, from, from my perspective, I think it's allowable in this case. There isn't any real practical alternative and there won't be any harmful uh, impacts of uh, allowing it. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, this is, uh, uh, so we want to issue an order of conditions um, and uh, someone want to make a motion to that effect and any specific or special conditions other than the standard conditions? Uh, I would recommend requiring that the uh, flood storage be created prior to or at the same time as the septic design. Yes. Good. Anything else? If not, uh, uh, is there a motion to uh, grant that order, order of conditions with that additional uh, condition? Yes, so moved. And a second? All second. Made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, uh, all in favor? Sarah? Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Oh. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We really appreciate it. Enough. Um, even though that was quick, we were scheduled to have um, the uh, second topic uh, at 535, so we're already just past that time. A request for determination of applicability to determine if utility pole installation in a buffer zone is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance. Um, this is uh, Bradford Street. Um, who's here presenting on that? I am. Uh, my name is Nick Ebel. I work for Conoco Engineers and Scientists representing Massachusetts Electric Company. Um, a quick overview of the project. Um, it's a combination of uh, maintenance projects where there's two replacement poles, P3-1 um, and P4, and they're putting in a new utility pole, which is going to be P3-50. Um, and, and an acre as well. Um, the replacement poles are exempt under the maintenance, um, but the new pole doesn't quite meet the definition for a limited project under the 10.02 2B2H um, because it is both too close to the resource area and it requires one tree to be removed. Um, the tree to be removed is going to be a 15 inch maple tree. Um, it's located right on the side of the road, pretty much. It's just a little bit set back. There's um, it's in, technically an intermittent stream, but I think it's kind of, it just kind of runs the road. It kind of follows the road ditch. And then behind the pole is going to be some wetlands. Um, but um, let's see what else. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much the basics of it. Um, I have, I, in our plans, I showed um, where the new pole is going to be. But the resource areas on the plan 
were from MassGIS, so they weren't exactly correct, like mm -hmm. outside of the poll. Um, but I think that's represented pretty well in the photo log that went along with it. Um, but yeah, um, they are seeking a negative determination um, going forward for this to put this poll in. And I think to I think it was for to help the span. I think it, there's a bit a decent sag in it, and that's about it. It, this is a standard wooden pole. I believe so. Yes. Uh, creosote. What What's the uh, anti rot treatment of such a pole? Um, I'd have to check with National Grid on that. I'm not sure exactly um, what their procedure is for that, um, but I think they come pre treated. I believe, or they they treat them before this installation. I believe. Just wondering if. Uh, there's any leaching risk that we should be aware of. Understood. Yeah, I'd have to check with um, the utility companies to make sure that that's a, the case. Other questions, comments from commissioners? But I guess as far as you know, the, the treatment is going to be the same as has been used with the previous polls. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would assume it's the same. And like I said, they're also doing two replacement polls that will probably have the exact same treatment for it. Mm -hmm. I think they have, they have some sort of standard practice. I'm not aware of exactly what it is or what chemicals they use or how they do it. But Other comments, questions? I mean, it's a relatively small um, surface area, a single pole, however much of that is uh, below ground, however much is above ground that might, uh, through rainfall and so forth, get uh, any kind of uh, water, surface water uh, uh, leaching into the soil. Uh, so it's, it's not a, a huge risk, even if it is creosote base or some other uh, chemical that could leach into the the soils, but uh, I'd, I'd feel better if we knew. Uh, um, but how it's far is it from the pole to the wetlands? Um, I don't have that on the screen right now, but I looked before. It's pretty pretty cheek by jowl. I want to say it's about seven feet, six or seven feet from the wetlands, and I think from the stream it was about about. I think it was almost 10, but it wasn't quite. I think maybe eight or nine feet. Um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, um, but it, it's definitely not not very far. Hmm. But like you, you mentioned, it's gonna be a, a quick thing and all the work's gonna be conducted from the roadway. Um, so it should just, should be very minimal impact other than the tree removal. Um, and the tree is, they mentioned that they might be able to just extensively trim, but I'm afraid if they do that, it's gonna kill it. So then you're going to be back in there anyways. So I think the better option would be to remove it now to avoid any sort of degradation or destruction later. And and you've got two other poles that are about the same distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the pole that is uh, let's see, the pole is one of the poles is across the street from it, and the other one is west of it down Bradford Road. The one that is west of it is currently closer to the stream than this pole, but by doing the replacement pole, I think they're looking to move it a little bit further away from the stream if possible. Um, the one that's across the road, it's only near wetlands. And I think they're also replacing, I think, um, it's either an anchor for each of them or two anchors for one of them. I can't remember exactly. Other questions or comments? A comment. Um, the two that they're replacing are they going to be the they're going to be the same treated poles? It hasn't been a big issue before. So I'm right. kind of wondering why we're making an issue. Um, and those wouldn't even come under our jurisdiction because it's normal maintenance or a utility. Right. Um, I don't know. 
my my thought was uh, that uh, uh, we we can't change what's already there, but when somebody comes before us, we have an opportunity to at least see what's possible to minimize impacts. And uh, if there are, and I've seen concrete poles, I've seen you know uh, uh, other than uh, creosote or other pressure treated wood. Uh, structures and so that was the basis of my question um if it okay, can be entirely so the, clean and untreated i feel a little better but like you say it's it's normal and it's what's happened in the past and there's stuff already there too so it's got to be tough for them to get a hold of an untreated pole normally treated before they even get to the yes, utility yards where the poles are stored um concrete pole maybe um not sure that they're not as flexible as the hard storms. Uh, the commission doesn't get that many applications for new poles within or very close to resource areas. It's usually either farther up in riverfront or in an area that's um, already been really degraded or is going in pavement. Uh, so I just uh, I thought it was worth bringing up just to talk about potential options. But as I say, it's a relatively small surface area. And, um, oh, not all right. Concerned. And the poles that were there previously, I assume, were also treated. And they're presumably being replaced. And I don't think there's a you know, six headed frogs running around out there. But um, I don't know. I, I know there's a lot of two headed frogs around, but that's something else entirely. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion? Uh, uh, let me see what Sarah. If we, if we determine that it will not impact the resource area, we can uh, issue a negative determination checking box three. Um, someone want to make a motion to that effect? Move. Well, I'll take um, Mason first and David second. Um, any further discussion? If not, uh, roll call, Sarah. All right, Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. And yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next we have a request for determination of applicability to determine if septic system installation in the riverfront area of the Mill River is subject to the Wetlands Act or the City Wetlands Ordinance, this on Meadow Street. And who's here to talk about that? Ward Smith. Hello. Um, Hello. This is an after the fact filing for a septic system repair upgrade. Um, it's within the 200 foot riverfront area to the Mill River uh, within an existing lawn. It's a very flat site, grass, and then a steep bank going down to the river um, dominated by knotweed. So the work was completed. Uh, I mean, I flagged the wetland in anticipation of doing a filing and the work was completing completed without uh, a filing being done. So we're requesting a negative determination for this after the fact filing. It's already got grass cover established on the site. And we have Mark Thompson here, who's um, the septic engineer, to answer any questions regarding the septic design. The, the, the system was put in at with no changes to the grade. So it, it basically looks the same as it did before the work uh, began. Mark, would you like to speak to that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I don't have much to add to it other than uh, uh, there was kind of uh, some miscommunication amongst the various people <clears throat> during the process, and uh, that's why we're here today. So the grade hasn't changed. Uh, uh, can you describe the uh, uh, surface prior to the work? It was a lawn. And it's still lawn. So it was lawn, and they put the system in, and it is lawn. It's uh, just over 100 feet from the river. Um, 
not too far. And if you go further from the river, uh, you hit a paved driveway and then there are buildings. So this was the, the preferred location for it. I guess the perk was, Mark can say, but the perk was good. So it didn't have to be a mounted system. It could be an at grade system. So no fill had to be uh, added to bring up the elevation. Um, what was the, what is the difference in size from the previous system to this system? Like just footprint wise? Um, the, the previous system <laughs> was a composting toilet with the urine diversion system, something I've never seen before. Uh, it was essentially an over engineered, um, latrine, uh, and that was uh, in the building and, um, it, it 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 was, uh, it was so disgusting that nobody was even willing to use it. <laughs> so uh, it was decided this initially started out as a tight tank replacement. Uh, I went to do a soil evaluation and uh, I was told that it was going to be all clay. And when we did the soil evaluation, it turned out to be river gravels. And it allowed for us to go ahead with the perk test and, and actually put an in-ground system there. Huh. Other questions or comments from commissioners? So there is there is no leach field there beforehand. No, it was a it, it was a, a composting. Uh, you'd almost have to see it, it was kind of a in a stall uh, in in one of the buildings and uh, Clivus Moultrie. I'm sorry, what? Is there a Clivus Moultrum, that kind of composting? No, the, the system was actually, this is Lance Curley, I'm the property owner. The mm -hmm. system was actually, a, it's a Phoenix system. So it's got a large four by three by five foot uh, holding chamber that sits beneath the uh, bathroom that we were using. And uh, it was permitted um, and Conservation Commission approved with no review, uh, designed by um, Tom Loye back in 2016 when we bought the property. And um, over the course of the following years, it was freezing solid in the winter and basically took the you know capacity to serve uh, our needs from our home business completely out of the picture and offline for roughly five months out of the year, despite trying different methods to keep it uh, heated. And so we were in need of a, a system and, and wanted to do a repair. And that's when we contacted Mark Thompson, uh, who reviewed the site and, uh, you know, proceeded with a conventional system in repair of this non-functional slash disgusting existing composting system. And Understandable. Go ahead, Jen. This might be an, I don't know exactly, and mm -hmm. forgive me if this is a dumb question, but um, is there not sewer access on Meadow Street? There's not. It um, it terminates just below the meadow at the bridge okay. on Meadow Street where Cordicelli cuts off. Yeah. It doesn't cross mm. that little bridge. Okay. And then it doesn't extend past the Florence soccer fields. Yeah. Um, basically, because we're the only residential property on this stretch of Meadow Street, it does yeah. go the closest would be the bridge at Cordicelli or Spring Street, which is a couple hundred yards yeah. down. Yeah. So we're one of the uh, lucky few that have town water and septic systems in town. Okay. That's helpful, thank you. I didn't yep. feel like that.
Other questions from commissioners or comments? Is this a, will we, is this a hearing? Do we close and then we will discuss or is now the time yeah, for questions for Sarah? Now it's the time for, I mean, it's an RDA, so it's, it's not, okay. I mean, right. it, we won't close a hearing. Okay. I guess I, this is my first sort of review of something that's already happened. And I don't know if Sarah, you have any guidance as to that's sort of tripping me up of like how to think about this. I know you instructed us to think about it as not built, but if you have any further. Yeah, I mean, really review it like you would if this were a new proposal for something that, that hadn't happened yet. Um, you know, if, if uh, a notice of intent would have been required otherwise, and um, you know, it doesn't seem like that's probably the case since the grade hasn't changed and it sounds like it was long to begin with, um, you know, just vote the same way that you would have um, and don't provide any, any credit for the work already having been done. Mm -hmm. And can I ask one more question? Sorry. Um, in, is like, is not having a map citing the system normal for an RDA request? So it, there is a septic plan included that shows distance to the um, the oh, river. Okay, but it yeah. no, but there's not actually a, a site plan beyond that. I think just for like that would have been helpful for me to sort of see visually the existing <clears throat> system and the current like the proposed system. Um, especially, I mean, I'm really trying to set aside the work having been done but for me like seeing that really clearly because it's hard to not take the picture the after picture um like that is good evidence that the grade hasn't changed but that's not sort of what we would have gotten on the front end usually so just sort of naming that without further comment i guess and uh, Lance and Mark, the the prior system was entirely within the footprint of the structure. Is that correct? Correct. There, um, there's a, an existing 1886 massive 56 by 160 foot hay barn, which uh, is where you know there there was an existing what we think is a pigsty that uh, was cleaned out. And that was determined as a logical location for this composting system, which we were um, permitted for and installed. And it's it's only about 12 feet from the repair system that's in ground. It's it's um, I actually I could screen share the um, septic plan, which actually shows the river, the location of the new in-ground system and the existing building where the composting unit is currently, uh, you know, situated, if that would be helpful. Please do. Okay. <clears throat> so screen share. And I'm going to go to this. Can everyone see this okay? Yep. Yes. Okay. So this box that I have drawn here in blue that I just highlighted is our existing hay barn. Meadow Street runs up in, in this area, oops, across the front of the property. Mm -hmm. And there is a separate detached structure, um, <clears throat> which <clears throat> is just across from this gravel drive. And the current bathroom and composting unit is situated within this building in this location. And the new uh, in-ground repair system is, this is the uh, two compartment septic tank and leach mm -hmm. field. Yeah. And this is the Mill River here. 
And I can also, uh, if it would be helpful, uh, let me see, share. Are you seeing the same plan still or a picture? Plan. I'm seeing the same plan. Okay. Let me, <clears throat> let me share a different screen, which is this one. Can everybody see the yep. Google yep. shot? So yep. this is the hay barn to the left of the dog in the driveway. This is the office building uh, to the right. And this gravel drive that the dog is standing in um, separates these two buildings. So the uh, composting system is about halfway down this hay barn um, kind of between these two flower baskets and just in underneath this roof line. And the septic system was installed tight to the edge of, to the right side edge of this gravel drive. And it's situated kind of right in this location. So <clears throat> we got it as far from the river as we could, um, but still serving the needs of, of you know, these structures essentially and um, I can show one more shot if it would be helpful which is mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. so this is the tank going in um, and the composting unit is essentially sits behind these two barn doors that I have dashed. So it's, you know, directly behind it. And this is the, uh, the yard area that, that it was installed into. It's a little uh, difficult to say if this had come before us, um, before there was any work, uh, both the tank and the leach field are mm -hmm. outside the 100 foot um, uh, uh, distance from the Mill River, but within the 200 foot, almost everything out there was within the 200 foot. Um, and so we probably would have had some questions. Uh, on the other hand, um, my overall sense is that if there's no change in in the topography, um, then uh, we probably would have permitted it. But you know, it's it's it's. Well, I think it's different. better than the urine runoff system you have. Yes, <laughs> I was going to say that. Uh, the, but I, I, the other system, the old system, the composting system was self-contained. So at least ideally, it wasn't supposed to, um, uh, no effluent was supposed to um, go on beyond, you know, composting systems usually are periodically uh, have the, the material removed and replaced. Um, and uh, But on a normal basis, it doesn't discharge. Um, so... It's, yeah, I think the difficulty, the difficulty I have is that it's already the work has already been done, um, and we're guessing at what we might have uh, required or might have wanted to know um, if we had had a chance to uh, review this beforehand. Go ahead. I asked Lance a question. Um, sure. Is the barn still being used as a barn, or is it you don't have animals anymore? We do. Um, the barn has multiple uses. We, uh, we are um, maintaining a small farm. We have seven goats that live in um, the front section of, of this barn to kind of the left of the bucket in the image we're looking at. Yep. Um, to the far right, where all the six light windows are, and the mound of dirt here, we have a <clears throat> permitted wood shop. And uh, our design build company does their 
trim production within that structure, uh, which is the only heated portion of the building. And um, so it has multiple uses, both personal and uh, for our company. Yeah. But it's not, you know, it's not like a herd of 50 cattle with uh, resultant waste uh, runoff being a problem in the book. No, you know, we have four livestock pens within the barn that were actually the original uh, housing for the draft horses that uh, previous owners that farmed the whole meadows uh, used to till fields and what have you. So we're still utilizing the, uh, you know, portions of the building, but we clean it out by hand and um, there's, we, we, we have some, we have chickens and we have goats. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I think for me, the thing I was going to say is I just, I think if this had come before the work being done, I would have loved to have seen a map with the 100 foot and 200 foot buffer. I know there's a yard on the other side of the gravel road, sort of closer to um, Meadow Street. I don't know a lot about what it would take to sort of go under that road to the barns to serve the barns for a system like this, but it would have I would have wanted to us to sort of look at pulling it a little, like it feels close to the river relative to where the property goes. But again, it's it's sort of a unique case. So, um, mm -hmm. and then the other question, and this is just my ignorance too, and maybe Sarah, you know, but how does septic siting relate to floodplain? Like, uh, as far as Title V septic regulations or I got, yeah. the Wilderness Protection Act. So uh, there aren't any specific requirements for floodplain. Conservation Commission would get involved, of course, if there was uh, a change in grade or an alteration to bordering yeah. subject to flooding. Uh, but as long as the separation to groundwater under Title V is met, there isn't a, another specific okay. requirement. Thank you. That's That's what I thought, but that's helpful. I just know with the storm this summer, like this is very flood prone land um, mm -hmm. and has flooded twice in the last 11 years. So it's just a thing on my mind, but I think that's all I have. Thank you. So what do you think uh, folks? I'm, I'm inclined to say, well, I wish you to come before us and I, um, I'm I'm not happy with the fact that we didn't get a chance to look at it beforehand. On the other hand, um, if there's no change in topography, my guess is that uh, no harm's done, and we probably would have found a way to permit it. As although, as Ken was saying, we might wanted to push back on its exact location. Um, but uh, my inclination is to say, all right. Um, this is a little hard to say because it's after the fact, but uh, probably there's no harm done by this project. And therefore, we uh, I forget which box Sarah said we could check. That would be box two. So it's a negative determination checking box two. Um, that would be my inclination is to say, all right. Um, Lesson learned, wherever the communication broke down, let's try to make sure that never happens again. But uh, um, in this case, I, no no parent harm is being done. I, I'd be inclined to allow uh, a, a negative determination. What do you, everybody else think differently? Um, I don't well, just, go ahead, Jen. I'm inclined to abstain, I guess, but I want to know if <laughs> where we are with quorum, if like, well, I, I don't want to object, um, but I also have enough discomfort that I don't feel totally ready to vote yes. Right, and and you're very, very familiar with this land, I know. Uh, 
I, I agree with say? Kevin's summary, so I'm I'm willing to vote to be yes on this. Uh, negative two on this one. Okay. Yeah. Would be yeah. A negative Sarah, if I abstain, will we, will we still be okay? Uh, yes. Okay. So I can make that as a chair's motion. Um, is there a second? Second. Second by David. Any further discussion? If not, uh, Sarah, roll call. Jen? I'm going to abstain. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Good to see you again, Ward Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good luck to you. Appreciate it. Um, so next we have um, notice of intent for construction of a four bay garage, driveway and stormwater management system uh, on East Hampton Road. Uh, and this, we had a bunch of new information come in this afternoon, which I uh, took a quick look at, but I have not had time to really read. So I think we need a little more of a presentation than we might otherwise. Sure. All right, I'm Terry Reynolds, uh, T. Reynolds Engineering, um, representing D.A. Sullivan and Sons. Uh, they're interested in building a uh, 67 by 54 foot four bay garage uh, behind the building that used to be the motorcycle shop on East Hampton Road. Um, I can share the plan if that's all right. I'll go over it. Should be able to. Okay, can you all see this? Yes. Yep. So this is the existing condition out there. So the existing building here, 504, uh, parking lots, um, big, big road right of way right here. This is five and 10 out, out here, mm -hmm. route 10. Um, and basically the majority of their frontage here out is all paved. Um, runoff basically divides right right in this area and comes down. Um, so this, this side of the site goes down this side and then over here comes down this bank uh, towards this house. Um, so what they're proposing is uh, to build a garage behind. Um, so it's a 64 by 57 and a half, I should say. Um, and so that's going to inc include demolition of this little piece of building here that'll be uh, grassed after um, and creation of a new parking area here where there's currently a gravel pad uh, in the back. Um, so in this area, there is, I'm gonna go back to the existing conditions. Um, we have the wetland right at, at the edge of the property here and here. So we have buffers. Uh, this is an industrial zone. So I've marked a 10 foot buffer is kind of the limit of where you can go in, a, in an industrial zone, 50 foot, 100 foot. So this is all buffers on and back here. Um, the perimeter here has extensive knotweed growing around uh, through here. Um, so um, basically this is gonna use up that entire back lawn area. Um, so to, to offset that uh, additional impervious area, proposing some stormwater management and um, stormwater control out here. So I'll just go over that first. So basically analysis was done to look at the water coming down here and then designed a system that is consists of a water quality swale through here um, that basically comes into what is an infiltration basin uh, swale, whatever you want to call it, throughout this area back here. Um, so basically the runoff from 
this roof area and this whole area up here either comes down the driveway this way or comes down the bank and comes down this way and eventually ends up in the wetland down here. Um, so this is going to collect basically all the runoff coming off the driveway. Uh, this is purposely pitched so that it goes this way to the north uh, into the water quality swale. It goes through uh, a pea stone, uh, berm, diaphragm sort of right here, uh, pre-treats before it goes to the water quality swale and then into this infiltration basin. The base of the basin uh, is designed to have um, a two foot engineered media, which is consists of sand, compost and topsoil. Um, this gives better control over infiltration. Plus it also enhances the water quality treatment. What's currently out here, it's, it's a rather interesting mix uh, this lawn area is all sand. Uh, so, and then uh, it's very shallow groundwater. So groundwater, high groundwater is at about 20 inches in, out in this area in this test pit here. Um, but because it's all sand, you expect that groundwater elevation to be consistent throughout the whole area. So this is designed a little bit, it's elevated above that area. That gives us a full two feet of separation to groundwater um that this can infiltrate too um the bat this building here um is pitched to the back so it all comes off the back and just goes directly into the infiltration area in the back of the building um so the 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 improvements out here are basically that we're we're getting a little better water quality with the infiltration basin and some better treatment of water coming off the paved areas through the water quality swale in this area. Um, additionally, uh, we're going to try and do some invasive management out here. So this knotweed is going to be removed in these on the property here, uh, and it has a, a treatment program that's near that's described here in the planting notes. Uh, that's a uh, uh, ongoing uh, program of, of trying to control the knotweed. Um, in addition to that, uh, plantings are proposed in that area, which is, is laid out in here. Um, basically, um, using uh, bayberry um, and uh, lady fern. Um, and in addition to that, on, we're adding uh, red maple in here which will provide shading and, and discourage the knotweed from coming in quite as, as aggressively. Uh, additionally, we have some tree plantings along the edge here um, to compensate for uh, kind of 26 inch maple here that has to be taken out for this project. Um, additional plantings will be down, are proposed down in this area in the, in the immediate buffer. And those plantings will be, uh, they're described right here as gray dogwood, um, low bush blueberry, black chokeberry, and nannyberry, uh, proposing basically um, uh, 12 um, shrubs to be located in this, in this immediate area, just below our stormwater treatment area. So that would be right in here. Um, so, um, that is basically it quickly. Uh, we have, you know, standard erosion controls extending around the entire work area, um, uh, tree protection, tree details. Um, we have, uh, a standard, uh, pad here for, for, for construction entrance and so on. So that, that's it. And I'll just let you guys ask questions. Um, what type of vehicles are going to be stored in this uh, garage? Uh, they're using it for construction, maintenance, so uh, small trucks and stuff, trucks, vans. 
reason I'm asking you, is there going to be an oil leak there problem were, from the there, vehicles and how is that going to be handled? They're, they're required to have floor drains in the building. And those floor drains are connected into an oil water separator and tight tank that's going to be located out in the parking lot right in front here. Uh, Terry, how will roof runoff be handled? The roof runoff is just shed. The it's a shed roof, and it's coming off the back of the building and goes directly into the infiltration swale there. You know, you know what the uh, the volume of the the swale. The volume, mm -hmm. uh, I have that in the stormwater calcs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 1,700 square feet in floor area. And the average depth? The average depth is only a few inches. Um, so we've got a berm at 145.6. And uh, the it's only two tenths deep, basically, before it overflows. There was mention of an engineered uh, material. I'm just not. Uh, I didn't print this out, and I don't have no, it. Screen it's it's a. It's what I've been using pretty standardly for rain gardens and infiltration basins. Um, and it's been very successful. It, it basically introducing good organics into the soil mix gives a very reliable, consistent infiltration rate through the material. Um, so it's, it's one third of a sand that has a sieve specification specifically for it. Um, basically um, compost um, and and then a sandy topsoil that goes with it. Uh, this would typically not hold water at all for the most part. It will take a major event for it to hold any water. It, it will probably never see water overflowing over that little berm unless it's a really, really big event. Um, and uh, basically it's, it's also going to be planted with a wildflower mix. Um, so for all of these, try and it's important to have them vegetated. And so in here, we're putting in a prairie, prairie moon nursery mix of uh, PDQ. Uh, so, uh, and that basically gets planted and um, the first year, you know, there's a procedure in here for doing it um uh but basically uh, first year it goes in with a an annual uh sort of grass mix along with the perennial seeds um and then you plug it in following years um and uh it has mow procedure that we use on it and knock 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 it down after it's gone to seed uh in the following years so it gets knocked down like once a year. The uh, reduced setback uh, uh, requires um, mitigation efforts that are re represent an improvement over prior conditions in terms of impact on the resource areas. So, uh, what do you see as the the improvements? Well, the improvements are. Um, Getting getting rid of the knotweed on site, um, providing a, a more stable um, growth that's in there. And the intent of that is is with the shrubs and the trees, they're going to help to shade it out and, and prevent it from coming back as easily. It will be an ongoing battle. Um, they'll have to consistently work on on removing it and you know and painting it. 
as needed. Um, uh, the other thing is the water quality. Currently, the water comes off the pavement with no treatment directly into a sand uh, that really isn't going to receive much filter before it hits the hits the groundwater. This this the media mix in here is going to really help give it a little better filtration before it goes into the groundwater. Um, so uh, you know, along with the water quality swale, pull stuff out before it even gets there. So basically, uh, invasives removal and improved uh, filtration. Yeah, yeah, along with slightly reduced, you know, runoff. But I, I wouldn't say that's a significant piece. Right. If it was sandy already, it probably the sheet flow probably went down as much as it went uh, across. I would guess. Yep. Yep. Other questions, comments from commissioners? Sarah, any additional thoughts since uh, your staff report uh, in response to the new information that has been received more recently? No, I don't, I mean, it seems like the the uh, re revisions will create some additional improvement. I I don't know how you're going to keep the knotweed from coming back, even with the maple tree. Um, on the site visit, I know we can't extend to other parcels, but I noted that there's a bunch of just junk dump just off the parcel, um, and a just a sort of just a tower of knotweed that must have come from some dump material. If there's some way you could coordinate with the abutting property owner totally outside the wetlands permitting process that might help you to get rid of some of that. Yeah, I am um, sure Mark would be open to that, uh, Mark Sullivan, the, you know, at least reaching out. Yeah, and this site has been disturbed going back to railroad days and the canal before that. Yeah. Um, so there, there definitely is some improvement going on. And how is the knotweed going to be taken out? Um, uh, we have a narrative down here. Um, so, so uh, knotweed shall be initially controlled by allowing the stand to grow without management in the spring, followed by cutting all stems to the ground early June. After June cutting, the knotweed shall be allowed to revegetate without management until just after flowering early to mid-September, uh, when a foliar herbicide spray shall be applied. Um, chosen herbicide shall be determined by a licensed applicator for not weed, typically 5% gloss, phosphate-based solution. Um, the applicator shall fully wet the leaves, but not to dripping. Um, so I believe that's a Roundup treatment essentially mm -hmm. no. um, so, yeah. it, if you if you cut it and apply it directly to the stems you'll save yourself some uh, herbicide and it because it's it's absorbed through the right stem material too yeah i i think if you prefer they go that route i mean that's a possibility um i'm not an expert in that um so that came from my landscape designer I'm not an expert, but I've uh, heard in previous applications arguments for uh, painting cut stems as uh, an efficient right. way to uh, get the glyphosate down into the uh, rhizomes. The um, the thing with this site is there is an extensive amount of them out there. Um, so, yeah. I mean, will will any of it be removed just through excavation uh, and? Yeah, a fair amount of that corner. That corner is somewhat elevated and can be removed with just with that elevation, with excavation rather. Um, you know, I my understanding is it goes pretty deep though and spreads pretty pretty laterally too. Yeah, I mean it's something that um they'd want to keep an eye on just because you don't want it coming up through your foundation either. 
Yeah, and and I guess you know some of the things with cutting it, you know, you you end up. I don't know. I don't even want to get. I, I'm not an expert. I'm not going to speak to it. But yeah, but, but cutting it, you have to do carefully because even little bits will take root all over again. Right. Uh, it's yeah. you know the idea of mowing it or anything like that. It's yeah, not. No, can't do that. Yeah, I mean the the issue with leaving it until just after flowering is that then you have to deal with the with the flowers because those are you know helping to spread it. But if you continuously mow it all during the growing season, you won't have to worry about that. Yeah, eventually the rhizomes will dry up. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of mowing. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think we're open to suggestions. suggestions. Uh, this is this is a process that you know is recommended, but if there's something else you would prefer, I'm sure we can go there. This is maybe a little off uh, target a bit, but um, where where does glyphosate stand in Massachusetts? I know there was discussion of banning it. I, don't think. I honestly don't know. I, I know it seems to be kind of the prime chemical yeah. people are using on this stuff. I think it's been banned in some communities in Mass. Um, I don't know. Sarah, do you know? Uh, there's been some discussions of it. Um hasn't been banned yet some communities are um, limiting its use not not by homeowners because you can't really do that as long as it's being sold commercially but in municipal uses um, and other places like northampton has um, not just glyphosate but a, mo a more broad policy that um, places where you know, like kids play and um, that are open to recreation don't have pesticide use You know, that, uh, our, our experience is that it is so virulent and, and creative in its ability to uh, revegetate that um, I understand the one of the argued benefits of re is removing wood, not weed, and um, that's going to take uh, some serious effort over multiple years uh, in order for that benefit to be realized. Um, so I, I uh, while I'm I'm not an expert, I I I know that um, we have been told by people who are more expert that if you can excavate the rhizomes that and carry them off site um, uh, and hopefully dispose of them in a way that they don't revegetate some place in somebody else's um, land, um, that that's the most reliable way to get rid of it. Otherwise, um, you know, spreading black plastic for more than a full growing seed, you know, things that are just really difficult to do on an um, active piece of land. Um, and so uh, that's, a, I think it, it's worth trying to make sure, and I don't know how we can embed this in a condition, Sarah, uh, that uh, there is a genuine plan, a credible plan for long-term uh, elimination or, or serious control of the knotweed. Shade isn't going to do it. I was no. trying to figure out a way to get one invasive to fight another invasive and whoever's left over is clobbered. But I figured maybe we brought into a completely third invasive that I couldn't kill anyways. Can we uh, uh, possibly make a, a condition? I don't know where Sarah uh, could the best expertise is for uh, not weed removal. But if if this is basing its uh, uh, eligibility for a reduced setback, uh, this application, uh, um, it's uh, in part on its removal of not weed, uh, is there a way we can uh, require as a condition that uh, somebody who is expert, whether that's uh, through the university or, or somewhere that says, okay, the way you can be sure to control it or get rid of it is X, Y, and Z. Could, could we make a condition to that effect? I think it's going to be really hard because it's off site also. I understand. It's going we're, to come we're back. We're talking about trying to control a little corner of it. It's it's extensive there. 
Yeah, I mean, it, Terry, I mean, even practically, do you have concerns about it coming up through the engineered medium and, you know, compromising the stormwater system? Well, I mean, it, it's it's the sort of thing that has to be removed yeah. in, in those areas. I mean, that's, that's part of the annual maintenance is okay. to go through and remove that stuff. Uh, Sarah, in the uh, um, habitat project over on Cook Avenue, um, there was discussion about excavating, and I forget how far down, in order to remove the rhizomes. Um, and I, but I can't remember how far down that yeah, was. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was unique because it was an isolated stand in the center of the parcel. So that yeah. could be like effectively removed as part of the construction. But that's not the case here because it extends so far off site. I mean, it this isn't oh, okay. where the knotweed is originating from. It's coming from off site, and this is sort of the edges of it. What I'm trying to wrestle with is since the argument that the reduced setback um, is allowed because of uh, mitigation, and part of the mitigation is removal of knotweed. I want, want to make sure we have a credible plan that we can say, oh yeah, well we we did our due diligence to make sure that this is a plan that's going to be. Uh, successful, um, and therefore we can allow the reduced setback. Yeah, um, I'm Terry. You have a ongoing O and M plan for the stormwater system. Would would there be any concern with just including mowing and treatment provisions for the for this area into that? I don't. I don't see a problem. I mean, that that's the essentially the intent of of what's on on the plan here is it's ongoing. Right. You know, uh, and that's the only way they're 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 not going to eradicate it unless they can, you know, go off off site beyond yeah. two or three properties beyond the one that's on now. Yeah, I honestly don't know how far it spreads out there, but you know, especially along the railroad tracks, those old railroad beds, it's everywhere. You know. Um, so I mean, you know, they it it all they can do is they can manage their property. It'll be hard to, you'll, they'll never get rid of it probably. Understood. Just, uh, uh, the, the, the rules that we're trying to follow about allowing the reduced setback uh, require us to have confidence that in fact there are going to be some improvements. And as well, you just described, one of the, uh, one of the improvements is getting this, this, to be less of a fact, getting that way to be less of a factor. Yeah, I, I will add that, you know, we are adding more native vegetation to shrubs and stuff in, in lawn areas that currently exist, um, in addition to trying to get rid of the knotweed. Understood. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And a second? And second. David? Uh, if no further discussion, roll call vote, Sarah? Uh, Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Um, so what do you think? I'm I'm inclined to say, all right, well, we're gonna give it a good try, but I, I, I wanna have uh, a little more confidence than um oh the the uh, landscaper says let's do it this way. I I'm not sure that the, that plan, uh, uh, and I, I am not an expert when it comes to this uh, not weed stuff, but I know how uh, almost ineradicable it is, and um, to get the best possible odds of controlling it uh, seems important in order for us to allow the intrusion in beyond the normal fifty foot barrier that uh, into well now we're going to have ten foot setback for 
for this special case because there's some improvement. So I want to make sure that we can be confident about that improvement. Um, so my my sense would be, and I, I, I don't know enough to know exactly what the uh, correct management plan is. That's why I asked before whether uh, consultation with somebody who is truly expert about um, genuinely minimizing the uh, chance of this staying out of control uh, as part of the conditions that we um, put in place in order to allow this. I'll say from my experience, and I've been trying to think about how to do this, but um, on our farm, we had not weed, not weed managed by a professional, and this was the method that they used. What I've observed sort of anecdotally is that it it matter it did a great job in the first three years of eradicating the knotweed but knotweed is so pervasive so it's really to me as much about the consistency of application over time as it is about the method that said consistency of a glyphosate spray like i think my preference would be for um I forget the like technical term, but like cut and treat if we're, if it's looking at sort of a longer period of time. But I know Sarah had mentioned in her notes about just having a record of the maintenance and including mm -hmm. that somehow. I'm not, I, I'm totally in support of sort of getting another outside view on the plan. Um, to some level, I think I would trust the professional and also just want to see some consistency of dealing with it over time. Well, and one of the DEP comments was the, the keeping of the log for detailed maintenance right. annually in perpetuity. Uh, that yeah. this is. Um, that could be an ongoing condition, too. Which, Nate Mason? It could be an ongoing condition. The uh, the Which removal of not we removal yeah the yeah. annual uh, annual monitoring and uh, removal and control of not we yeah it could it could simply be the same connected completely with the basin maintenance can you figure out how to phrase that as a condition Sarah uh, I can. So the, it, the gist of it would be that we're also requiring um, ongoing treatment and follow-up reporting of yeah. weed removal. But I'll, I'll yeah. write it more eloquently than that. <laughs> um, any other comments, conditions uh, that we might want to add with the, the maintenance of the log uh, as DEP requested um, would be a uh, one of the specifics, anything else? Just uh, not as a condition, but um, it, it, to the extent that during excavation, um, uh, the rhizomes can be removed and taken off site somewhere, that, that'll that get you a head start um, and probably yeah. worth doing. Yeah. We won't make that as a condition, but um, uh, this is, I don't know whoever brought this into the country, but um, this is <laughs> almost nationwide a problem. It really is. It's awful. All right. So uh, any other conditions? If not, somebody want to make a motion? Uh, standard conditions and those couple of uh, special conditions, uh, but to uh, uh, grant this uh, order of conditions? I'll move. I'll second. Mason, second. And Jen? Sarah, roll call? All right, we're going to try and vote. Uh, Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Good luck. All right. <laughs> and now uh, we have any other business, Sarah? Oh, just the, uh, so that the request for uh, Right, the extension of the order from the Carolyn. planning department. Uh, so 
I'll summarize it for Carolyn. This is, was permitted uh, a few years ago, extended due to uh, COVID permit tolling due to changes in Mass DOT's requirements for parking lots and tree removal and other types of details. The city is working on a second go around of 100% design plans. So usually when you get to the 100% stage, you're, you're good to move to construction. Um, but in, in this case, Mass DOT went back and required some additional changes. Um, planning department is working on those, but the order will be expiring this February. Uh, so an extension would be needed to allow that to move forward. And there may be some uh, changes that come back for an amended order, but this is just extending the order as it exists. As it currently is, okay. Someone wanna make a motion to grant that extension? So moved. And a second? Second. All right. Um, any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Sarah? Jen? Yes. Beth? Yes. Dave? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Unanimous. Okay,